All right, we got to get to this other thing. Just We have just about another 10 minutes, but we need to talk about this. Um, Thomas Friedman, and I, it's hard because ever since, I mean, I think the first Matt Taibbi essay 10, 11 years ago or whenever, I mean, Thomas Friedman's a joke. We all know he has his writings embarrassing. He hasn't had an original thought in decades. He's a blind cheerleader of corporate globalization of Saudi monarchs of Israeli generals. And, you know, is generally just a big egotistical embarrassment who is totally insulated from the effects of all of the horrible things he advocates. And again, is also just like a very embarrassing writer and, you know, his popularity amongst elites reveals their relentless mediocrity. But this piece is important to dissect just a little bit. We can't get to all of it, but this is important. A plan to get America back to work, some experts say it can be done in weeks, not months, and the public and the economy and public health are at stake. Um, we're going to go over a couple of key points in this, uh, and I'll throw it to you in a second, Ben. And I, I have some points I want to hit on this too, but I just want to really, again, I keep emphasizing this. It's very important that you fit what Donald Trump said yesterday with this column. The generic, silly kind of you know MSNBC mindset is because this column is a lot smarter, and there's some quotes from scientists, and there's a lot of hand wringing, and there's a lot of caveats, uh, and a lot of magical thinking about healthcare, which is something I'll get to. Uh, that it isn't the same fundamental message as Lloyd Blankfein has tweeted out as CEO of Goldman and as Donald Trump is pushing as president, and by the way, as Andrew Cuomo has alluded to, which is that we got to get people out in the workforce and literally you will die for Wall Street. The solution, we know, and I'm going to keep being a broken record, send people a couple thousand or more a month, stop rent, expand health care. Uh, expand unemployment, rapidly deploy worker protections, all these other very basic things, beef up food stamps, stop all of this stuff. We could sit and pause most things for several months. People would be very fine. It would actually have some desirable environmental side effects, and then we can kind of get things going again. But all we're seeing mostly is a massive corporate slush fund and now um, a push to end this way before anybody says it should be ended. So this is the upmarket version of that argument. Ben, what were some things you noticed in this piece? Uh, yeah, so, I mean, uh, reading this, um, kept thinking about, there's this uh, meme that's been going on that's like a variation of the classic uh, trolley meme, except for there's only one track, a bunch of people are on the track, and it says you can stop the trolley at any time, but, um, That'll disrupt trolley service and be bad for the profits of the company that owns it. Uh, and that's that's pretty much what um, Thomas Friedman is making a straight-faced uh, argument about here. It's a very thin argument. Um, you know, he again, there's there's an attempt at dressing it up a little bit better than what Trump said. It's definitely the wine track version. There are some caveats, you know. That uh, like you know, he starts to make comparisons with the flu, and he says, of course, it's, it's much worse than the flu. Right, because he realizes that he's starting to sound too much like Trump. I know it's not because an editor said anything, because he's clearly not edited. Um, but one thing that I think is is really worth um, going in on is the doctor who he finds to uh, to quote. Um, is this the doctor John P. A. Iadonis, an epidemiologist and co-director of the Stanford? Meta Research Innovation Center, which sounds, you know, that, that sounds quite prestigious. It does, although uh, although meta and innovation, you know, make me wonder, but who knows? In, indeed, indeed. Uh, but, he, uh, but he says, uh, so he gives this metaphor, right? He says, if an elephant is attacked by a house cat, frustrated, trying to avoid the cat, the elephant accidentally jumps off the cliff and dies. And I'm wondering right there, uh, because in this case, remember, the house cat is something that all the, the experts, and he's not contradicted this, uh, have said if we let it run rampant like the flu, it'd kill 90 million people around the world. Um, but, you know, that's, that's, that's quite a house cat. 
But uh, but he says he gives these examples of how you know the cure might be worse than the disease. Uh, so, or sorry, this is this is not the first guy. This is the second doctor he quotes the director. Oh, of Stephen the, Wolf, yep. uh, Center uh, 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 Director Emeritus of the Center on Society and Health at Virginia Commonwealth University. Sorry, go ahead. Yep. Um, so so he's retired from being the director of that, but yes. Right. That's what that means. Uh, society's response to COVID-19, such as closing businesses, locking down communities, this guy says, may be necessary to curb community spread, but could harm health in other ways, costing lives. And he gives some examples, and pay close attention to his examples, because these don't make a lot of sense. He says, imagine a patient with chest pain or developing stroke where speed is essential to save lives, hesitating to call 911 for fear of catching the coronavirus, uh, or a cancer patient having to delay chemotherapy because the facility is closed, or a patient with emphysema who dies for lack of facility uh, with a ventilator. And the first thing that I think is worth pointing out, if we're going to have a rational discussion about this, is that all three of those examples are, are about things that aren't closed under any shelter-in-place order, right? Even in Spain, even in Italy, right? You know, all of those, you know, the most extreme lockdowns, all of those, you know, you still have uh, emergency, uh, you know, you still have emergency medical services. You can, you know, you can dial 911 or do whatever the equivalent is. Uh, I, I haven't, you know, there's been a certain amount of political wrangling about things like, oh, is abortion a necessary medical procedure or whatever? Nobody suggested the chemotherapy. Uh, isn't you know isn't a necessary medical procedure that would still be available, uh, and as far as that last one, the dying uh, the patient with emphysema who dies for lack of facility with a ventilator, unless Wolf is just suggesting that uh, that we stop treating people with COVID nineteen, I'm not a, I'm not sure I understand that one at all. I don't. That sounds like actually that would be a pretty significant and problem in general if somebody with emphysema didn't have facility with a ventilator. That sounds like a problem. It does. And in fact, the, the best of times. But that's also exactly the problem uh, that social isolation is, is, is designed to avoid. Mm -hmm. That, um, that the, the reason, the primary reason we're doing all of this uh, is precisely because of of fear that if we uh, that if we do what Trump wants, what Friedman wants, uh, what Lloyd Blank fine, and you know all the rest of the cheerleaders for this death cult of capital want, uh, then uh, then it's going to spread too it's going to spread too quickly, right? And and that means that the hospitals will be overwhelmed and there won't be enough ventilators to go around. That is exactly the concern that this is supposed to solve. So if we follow Friedman's advice and ignore what uh, the epidemiologists, you know, seem to be mostly saying, um, this is exactly the kind of problem that would, you know, the, uh, that would be exacerbated by that, right? You know, because if more people are out of the streets interacting with each other, then the virus spreads more quickly, um, more people uh, need to be hooked up to ventilators, and there are fewer of them left, for either your guy with emphysema, uh, or just random people, um, you know, or or for coronavirus patients, right? Either one, right? You know that, that that's the, that that's the concern that you're not going to have enough left for the people and, who need them. And then just really quick, just scroll up uh, uh, back right up, uh, yeah. And imagine the stress and mental illness that will come and already has come from shutting our economy down. It's triggering down. Uh, triggering massive layoffs. Uh, massive layoffs. So this is just, and you know, this is the macro point, but actually let's, let's keep doing this. Income is one of the strongest predictors of health outcomes and how long we live. Wolf said lost wages and job layoffs are leaving many workers without health insurance and forcing many families to forego health care and medications to pay for food, housing, and other basic needs. People of color and the poor who have suffered from generations with higher rates, uh, death rates, will be hurt uh, the most and probably help the least. So basically, then, you are describing system-wide problems that happen on wow. a daily basis that already do do exactly the things that he's outlining here, 
because of our, our economic structure, but because, and going back to Thomas's Friedman's own concept of the golden straitjacket, which is the model that he said was the corporate globalization model of the late 1990s, which is that, sure, you can have elections, but there's no democracy in macroeconomic policy. You need to deregulate. You need to lighten taxes. You need to let corporations pretty much do mostly what they want. Um, with some light regulation around the edges. He's not a complete neo, you know, he's not a libertarian. He's a Clintonite Bloomberg person, which is on the same spectrum and, you know, incredibly spectacularly awful. Um, they have just outlined all of the things that the column could be about for either dealing with Corona or just dealing with system wide problems like we need Medicare for all as like the most obvious and urgent example. And that also just, I, we can't do as forensic, but I just want to say there's a number of points in this article where when he's covering his ass, he's like, well, of course we need to like rapidly deploy resources to hospitals and we need to get that medical funding out there. And it reminds me of Hillary Clinton tweeting out in praise of South Korea the other day. And there's a way in which like, particularly when it's from countries that folks like, you know, feel comfortable valorizing on some level. And again, I've said, I have an enormous, I think especially their current progressive government in South Korea is super admirable. I have a ton of respect for them, but like, don't let these people say, use South Korea as an example, or talk about rushing resources to hospitals when they have fought every step of what would make that even possible. Like mm -hmm. South Korea is more comprehensive. South Korea has Medicare for all plus. So Thomas Friedman sprinkling in these like, oh, and then we also need healthcare solutions, which will require massive public investment, Bernie Sanders policies, and we should do that too. So he's simultaneously saying, go kill yourself. Here are a list of real problems that I will provide no solution to other than go kill yourself. And oh yeah, we should also do these like incredible things with healthcare that I advocate is not being possible to do. And then, you know, Hillary Clinton, of course, let me tell you, South Korean healthcare is filled with ponies, just filled. South Korea's healthcare system is chock filled with ponies. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I lived there for three years. Uh, you know, I, even as a non-citizen, I was on the uh, Korea national uh, national health insurance, um, which uh, <laughs> which was nice. Cause you really got used to that. But uh, but but I I, I just want to yeah key in on this on this uh, concern trolling of the mental health about the mental health of the low-income workers who he wants to use as cannon fodder to restart, you know, the economy. Um, because what, you know, what are the alternatives, right? Like, you know, like, like basically he's presenting it as this, uh, this false dilemma between either we tell people to go back to work and, you know, good luck, wash your hands a lot, uh, or, or we just do nothing, right, and, and allow, you know, allow the economy to crumble. Uh, when the obvious, you know, the obvious third choice uh, is at least forget whatever else we do. Start with some sort of at least temporary UBI, right? You know, say, you know, send everybody a check every month. Um, and if if that's what we're talking about, if we're not talking about send everybody back out to work uh, versus do nothing, we're talking about send everybody back to work plus do UBI plus do rent freeze, healthcare, all this stuff. Um, then which one of these do you suppose is going to be worse for your mental health? Um, <laughs> right. Being at home, uh, getting a check, right? So you still have income, uh, but uh, maybe you're a little bored and stir crazy. That's option one. Option two is being told that you need to march back to work during a fucking plague because Thomas Friedman's stock portfolio you know, is starting to look a little iffy. His wife's you know? family might not be able to open as many foot lockers. Um, yeah, so, you know, whatever. Look at the photo of Thomas Friedman's house in Maryland and ask yourself about his position. I mean, as David Sirota said, we literally have a pundit class of people who are like, 
I'm really, I, wait a second. My Amazon prime deliveries might take a couple of extra days. Fuck that. Look at this. Look at, look at his house. <laughs> this is where he's riding out or potentially, I mean, I think this is I'm sure this is one of several. I mean, he's I married know. into an enormously he's wealthy. Money. He's mm. married into money in addition to his own income. Like his wife, I believe his wife's family does have like multi million dollars, maybe even a billion from Foot Locker chain. Like they are <laughs> like literally that. So this guy is sitting in some situation like that, telling you because he cares about you so much. I mean, yeah, he's yeah. concerned about your mental yes. health. He wants just, you to feel good. If you're so just you know, Corona, if you're just sitting there, you know, um, you know, if you're just sitting there fucking around on social media and playing video games, you know, you might start to feel sad, right? And he wouldn't want that. So instead, you should uh, you should go out to um, help people try on shoes every day at Foot Locker and you know. Uh, hand sanitize 200 times a day and pray that that's enough and you don't get sick because there probably aren't going to be enough ventilators to go around. Oh, we are run by a death cult. Oh yeah. We are run by a death cult. And they don't want you to realize how good we all could have it. That's fundamental to all this, too. They are afraid in a situation where we're supporting people through these emergency provisions that people realize, hey, wait a second, you know, maybe this is bullshit that I have to toil away 45 hours a week to build Foot Locker's fortune uh, to support Thomas Friedman's blovated life, right? And that's what they're afraid of happening. Yeah, I mean, right. it's, like the thing, it's like the student loan cancellation. Like, Really, there's a perfectly solid, you know, mainstream capitalist argument that uh, that that it would actually be a massive economic boon, right? You know, that it would be good for the business climate to cancel everybody's student loans because oh, yeah. you know everybody would, would be able to to spend more money, you know, on the consumer economy. It'd be great for uh, housing people, production. Yeah, yeah, the people more you know most likely to spend it, right? You know, buy homes, all this stuff. Uh, but admitting that it never, it's like, um, it's like when one of the first things that happened after when the pandemic was spreading was that the TSA lifted its, uh, its 12 ounce rule for hand sanitizer, yeah. you know, which was kind of giving away the game, you know, that it's like, Oh, wait, wait, wait a second. We're not worried about terrorism because people can bring more than 12 ounces you know, of hand sanitizer. But since that was always security theater, it was never real, right. They could just do it and without worrying about it. It's the same thing with student loans that if you, that if you admit that there's no reason we have to hold people to this, right. That they, that like this is a pure social decision we're making to live like this, and mm -hmm. we could easily, right, on a policy level, it's essentially a snap of the fingers, decide that nobody had to do this anymore. Then if you did that, I think that would just give people too many other ideas. You know, what else could we just decide that we didn't have to do anymore? Yeah, like, do we exactly. need landlords, et cetera? And we ought to make those decisions and support each other in making those decisions because we can't be run by a death cult anymore. And, you know, even if they're, I mean, you know, again, like obviously Friedman's a silly jackass, but it's a good reminder of, you know, like, just like extraordinarily evil shit. <laughs> ben Burgess, everybody check out his Patreon page, check out, give them an argument logic for the left. Stay safe, stay healthy, brother. Uh, thanks, man. Thanks, man. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.